I want to speak a message today. The Lord really put them on my heart for us all a couple of months ago. And I call it learning to treasure the word of God. Jesus said in both Matthew 4.4 4 and Luke 4.4, 4, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Say with me, every word. Unfortunately, we're creatures of habit, and we tend to, after reading the Bible for a while, we tend to find our favorite passages, favorite scriptures, but this book, is, well, this Bible, is just so filled, every chapter, which has life in it. Even kind of the boring chapters of the Old Testament that just have lineage, you know, whole chapters saying so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so, even those just speak of the involvement of God throughout the generations in our families and lives, how particular and thorough he is. Psalm 138, verse 2, reads, You have exalted above all things, say above all things, you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Quite often when you say to someone, Christian or uh, non-Christian even, uh, oh, this thing's getting hung up here, but when you say, well, what is God? What, what are the priorities of God? What are the values of God? And everybody always says, God is love. And we think about the motivation of God, the acts of God, and of course that is love. But God himself says he exalts above everything his name and his word. And the reason for that is, is the word is Jesus. Jesus is the word. In John chapter 1, verse 1, it reads, In the beginning was the word, and this is speaking about Jesus, it's the word logos, and the word was with God, and the word was God. When we think about the Trinity, when we think about the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, you know, we could have a month of Sundays talking about that. We still wouldn't understand it. It's a bit of a mystery. But the reality is the Father, as we think about it, is, as Paul called him, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who wills things. Jesus is the one who reveals things. In uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 19, we're not going to read the whole thing, but it reads towards the end, For in him, Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Jesus is the perfect reflection of the nature, the attributes of the Father, and he came to reveal the Father. In John 14, 9, he said to his disciples, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. We love to quote what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, but the following verse says, the way to what? Nobody comes to the Father but through me. And so Jesus is the word throughout from Genesis all the way to Revelation, this book is not just a set of words put down on paper. It's not just a list of do's and don'ts. It's not just a list of suggestions. It's not just a list of platitudes and happy thoughts. It is the revelation of God, and that's what Jesus is. He's the Word, the revelation of the Father. It's the Holy Spirit that performs here on earth through us the works of God. But to spend time... Got this thing messed up. But to spend time in the Word is to spend time with Jesus. You cannot separate the two. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, Paul wrote, all scripture, say with me, all scripture, and that means from Genesis all the way to Revelation, all scripture is breathed out by God. And it's interesting, that word, it's, this is the Greek, obviously, in the New Testament, but in the Hebrew, the word for spirit is the word ruach that means breath of life. This is why in John 20, when Jesus appeared to the 12 disciples at 11 now after the resurrection, it says he breathed upon them and he said, receive the spirit. This is why in the day of Pentecost, and by the way, this is Pentecost weekend. We're going to be praying into that a little bit later. But on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came like a mighty rushing wind. But all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God, that means you and I, may be complete, equipped for every good work. Sometimes I, I read in uh, some so-called Bible teaching blogs and things like that online, and I hear people say, well, you know, we're New Testament, we're Christians, we're New Covenant, we don't need the Old Testament. And they mistakenly dismiss the law as saying, well, we're no longer under the law. 
But the reality is the Apostle Paul in Romans 7.12 said the law is good. The problem with the law, all the lists that God expected of us in the Old Testament, is aside from the Holy Spirit within us who gives us self-control and strength and power, you're unable to walk in the fullness of the will of God. And so Paul said the law is good. For those who say we're no longer under the law, I would say you're right. Actually, we're above the law. Jesus set a whole new standard when he came of what God expects of us. For example, in Matthew chapter 5, on two occasions, starting in verse 21 through 22, he said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. He brought the expectations of God for us to a whole nother level. He also said in Matthew 5, starting verse 27, You have heard what was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with his heart. A whole nother level. But it's as I said, the problem is uh, before Christ in the cross, the Holy Spirit was not poured out. And so in our own, it was impossible to live up to the law. The law was intended as a tutor to teach us our need for Jesus. But now that the Holy Spirit's here, part of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, in which we can say yes to the things God calls say yes to and no to the things God calls us to say no to. Obedience to God results in experiencing the fullness of the kingdom, which Paul said is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. How many of you know right now the greatest need in most of the world is not money? It is peace. There has been so much of a fear factor that's brought on by COVID. You see it everywhere. And part of it we can trace back throughout the generations, you know, and the increase of violence and all the things and all the uh, craziness in life. But there is lack of peace, and people are going to an extremes to try to get some sense of peace in their life. But God intended us to live out of his kingdom peace in the Holy Spirit righteousness, peace, and joy. This is the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit within us. But as opposed to that, disobedience to God results in demonic addictions, shame, resulting depressions, and sometimes even physical illness. Jesus, or Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, he will also reap. The one who sows to his own flesh will also from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So when we talk about living according to the Word of God, in Christ Jesus we are now no longer under condemnation, Paul said, meaning we're not going to be judged for our mistakes by eternal damnation. We pass from death into life in Christ Jesus. But on the other hand, even as the sons and daughters of God, we can reap blessings of God, the fullness of His love and His kingdom, or we can put barriers up between he and I, between him and us. That's just a reality. I love the phrase that we've all heard, we're always free to make choices, but we're not free to avoid the consequences of those choices. Mark, that was a brilliant point you made. Do not be discouraged by those <laughs> blank looks on their faces. If... Uh, I ran into Nick this morning. If you don't know Nick Wagner, he's our everything guy in the practical sense. He maintains the grounds, everything. If there's a problem, you run to Nick. This church probably wouldn't be functioning without Nick around. Nick has a key ring about that big around, and he's got, I looked at at least 20 keys on there. I want to share with you this morning uh, a number of keys from Psalm 100, uh, 119. And you can be glad we're only going to look at the first 16 verses, because as some of you know, there's 176 verses. Some of you should say, thank you, Mark. But uh, we're only going to look at the first 16 verses. And a key, as we all know, but I want you to think about this, is something unlocks a door. But once that door is unlocked, you still have to choose to walk through it. And these are all essential keys about God's Word. So if you've got a Bible and you want, it'll be in the overhead, but you can turn to Psalm 116.
The first key is found in verses 1 through 3. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. When we walk according to the ways of the word of God, we can have a blessed life. That does not mean we never have problems, but we can know God's provision, his wisdom, his insight by his word and his spirit, even in a time of distress, even in a time when everything is falling apart. I love the promise in Psalm um, 37 that the righteous will prosper even during a time of famine. And we've seen a lot of that happening with people whose jobs and income have been threatened during COVID and everything else. But when we walk in the ways of God, we experience blessings. What is blessings? Well, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. And the best translation of the Greek word abundant into English would be superabundance. He wants you to be full of his goodness. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came, John 10.10, that you might have life and have it abundantly. The second key is found in verse 4, which reads, You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. When we have a growing knowledge of the Word of God, it inspires diligent obedience. Not compartmentalization, being one person in this situation, another person in a different situation. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 through 20, Moses said to the people, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today, and I have set before you uh, life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live loving the Lord your God and obeying his voice and holding fast to his word. And even as a Christian, you may have for sure the promise of eternal life in Christ Jesus but the quality of life that God has, has in store for you, that he intends for you, that his will is for you here on earth, that can be seriously deterred by a lack of obedience on our part. Now, let me stop right there, because whenever we begin to talk about personal holiness and obedience to God, the question always rises, well, is he talking or is she talking about sinless perfection? No, only Jesus lived a perfect life and will live a perfect life. But when we read about what Peter and the Apostle Paul talked about ongoing sin, they very clearly, in the original language, talked about those who practice these things. The word practice, like playing a piano, you practice it, you do it over and over and over yet for the sake of getting good at it. So we're not talking about making an occasional mistake, you know, or losing your temper and saying, oh gosh, God's gonna angry at me forever, no that John said that God is faithful and he's quick to forgive when we repent. We need to always remember repentance is actually a gift God has given us so we can come and get a fresh start in certain areas of our life. But Moses, the word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said, choose life that you may know the fullness of what God has for you. Verses 5 through 6 read, Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I will not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. When we walk and live according to the word of God, it brings us freedom from shame. What is shame? Many people confuse shame and guilt. Guilt is realizing you've done something wrong. But shame is different. Guilt has to do with what you've done, but shame has to do with your self-identity about who you are. The last 10 or 15 years, everybody's been talking about uh, identity theft, you know, on the internet, you know, or through someone getting hold of your credit card numbers, your social security, all of that. But do you know that from the beginning of time, Satan has been practicing identity theft. He came to rob, kill, and destroy and I, don't, I, could do a whole, I do have whole sermons, actually, on the power of shame and getting free of it. But I define shame as deep-rooted, illogical, ill feelings about yourself when it talks about Christians. Because so many Christians, because there's a bondage to an unhealthy area in their life, it could be anger, bitterness, uh, jealousy, it could be sins of the heart, sins of the hand, 
accompanying shame comes in. We realize we're guilty, but going hand in hand with that is shame, and it begins to rule over your self-image. And all of a sudden, you find yourself, you're not expecting God to answer your prayers. You're not expecting people to love you for who you are in the body of Christ. You're not expecting life to work out according to the goodness of God because your self-identity has been marred as opposed to seeing yourself as forgiven in the love and grace of Jesus, a son or daughter that's now seated at the banqueting table of our Heavenly Father. And I tell you, you know, it's just... um, The devil is so intent on robbing each of us, even as Christians, of what God has for us. Verse 7, I will praise you with an upright heart, meaning walking in righteousness, when I learn your righteous rules. You know, a phrase has become increasingly popular with the, the, the woke cancel culture and all of that is trigger. And, oh, that person triggered me. Oh, they said this, it triggered me grow up, get a life, get some self-control. That's, that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I read about some of these things online, or once in a while I, I get on social media and look at, oh, this person triggered me. Grow up, would you? You're not a two-year-old. Stop having these temper tantrums, you know? Life isn't all about little old you, but that's, that's another message. But, but anyway, there are certain trigger words, even for Christians, such as law, the precepts, the rules of God. But these things God gave us not to just test us, although they do test us, but so that we might choose life. And when we're walking and we can, in the ways of God, we have an experiential knowledge of righteousness. And again, Romans 14, 17, Paul said, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness is not just a legal state that you're forgiven of your sins by the Father. It is that, but it's more than that. It's the person of God that you can experience it. I've been a a runner for uh, about 50 years now, and that just kind of gives you a clue to how old I am. Start as a teenager. I I know I only look about 32, but there we go. It's not the years, it's the mileage, as Harrison Ford said. (laughs) But... Here's the the reality about running, that uh, although I'm a a passionate runner, there's many times the last 50 years where I have to take a month or two, sometimes six months off for running because it's just a very busy schedule or you get out of habit. And then I start running again. And even though we understand our muscles have memories of what they used to do, it begins to pick it up rather quickly. You know, I like to do three, four, five-mile runs. I used to run longer when I was younger, but I'm trying to save my knees now. But... I'll start running, and the first week, you know, running three or four times a week will be brutal. The second week is brutal, but not quite as brutal. But it will take me anywhere from 30 to 45, sometimes 60 days to get back at the point where I can really go out and do that three, four, five-mile run and really enjoy it. Up to that point, I'm thinking, why am I so masochistic? Why am I doing this? My legs are hurting, my back's hurting, my, <laughs> my lungs feel like they're going to collapse. But then all of a sudden, you get to that one day, and you do that three, four, five-mile run, and all of a sudden you feel like this is what I was created to do. And it's a total joy, and all the endorphins and everything is just uh, kicking in, all of that. But that's what it's like when we get freed from an unhealthy habit, anger, bitterness, jealousy, envy, all those things of the heart, but as well as outward sins in the hand that we might be involved with. When we get free of that and we're walking, it filled with the Holy Spirit, experiencing his righteousness, you realize this is what you were created to do. One person's excited. I'm going to focus over here. <laughs> this crowd here, you're kind of on your own for a while. <laughs> Verse 8. I will keep your statutes... Do not utterly forsake me. And this is a roundabout promise that God promises us his presence. As we know and lean into the Prince of God, the person of the Holy Spirit, we can do all things. Say with me, all things. We can do all things, Paul said, through Christ who strengthens us. Psalm 105, verse 4, Paul, David said, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek 
his presence continually. Seek his presence continually. Daily, when we wake up, at some time before we really get engaged with the day, we need to say, Lord, I need your love, I need your grace, I need your self-control, I need your wisdom. Please fill me fresh this day. And he is faithful. God gives his spirit without measure. Verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? And it's not just young men that have problems. It's, it's all of us deal with issues in our life. It doesn't matter whether you're 78, not that I'm 78, but, um, or 18. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. When we begin to have a growing knowledge of the word of God, it's spiritually like money in the bank. All of a sudden, uh, an opportunity, and you're thinking, oh, is this right or wrong, or a situation you're not sure about? But all of a sudden, because the word is alive, it'll pop up. The mind of Christ pops up and it gives you discernment. You realize, no, I can't step into this situation. No, I can't hang out right now with these people. It's not of God. It's not going to be good. And it's the Holy Spirit that gives us discernment. Proverbs 14, 12, as well as 16, 25 reads, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. We are besieged right now with all these voices out there, bloggers, podcasts, television personalities, that are all prescribing what they think is right and wrong. They're all prescribing what's true, what's false. We're actually in a world today where there's a growing philosophy that there's no such thing as cold, hard truth. Well, I've got news for people. Jesus is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he has absolutes of what brings life and what brings death. There's a way that seems right to man. And there are so many people saying, well, this makes me feel good when I do it. But you see, part of the Satan and demon's enticement is the first or one occasion with something, he'll give you a false sense of peace, a false sense of joy, but it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper into bondage, and you realize you're a prisoner of it. But it's never like the peace of God. It's never like the joy of the Holy Spirit. It's never like the righteousness of God. It's all a counterfeit. The word of God is alive, and when we're familiar with his word, the mind of Christ will pop up within us, and the Holy Spirit will bring just uh, insight into different situations and different opportunities that can be right or wrong. The seventh key is the word of God calls us into wholeheartedness. In verses 10 and 11, it reads, With my whole heart I seek you, let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Jesus said when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He answered in verse 12, verse 30, love the Lord your God with all of your heart. But he didn't stop there. Sometimes people think, well, what's it like to love God? I think, well, it's, it's like what I experience on Sunday morning or Saturday night when they're doing my favorite love song, worship songs to God, and, you know, everybody's in a good mood, and there's this vibe flowing. No, that's not love. Jesus said in John 14, 15, that if you love me, you will obey me. Love to God is our walking with him and walking in his ways. And so, again, the psalmist is saying, with my whole heart. And Jesus didn't say, just love the Lord your God with your heart, but with your mind. And that this book, you know, I've, I'm going to talk about this in a few moments. We've got a number of these here to give away. You know, it just looks like a, a book, pages, and all of that. But these words are alive. They are spirit. They've been spoken by Jesus, God Almighty. And it's not just a card cover or a leather cover or, you know, whatever you've got or electronic version like mine. It is life. And we're to be filled up in our minds and souls. And I want to encourage some of you, and I'm, I'm going to stop. Uh, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to hedge what I say. I don't want anybody to accuse me of preaching. But you need to be careful of how much time you spend on social media. You need to be a little bit careful of how much time you spend taking in blogs of this and that because in a lot of things, there's an element of truth in it. Like a Bible verse may be uh, quoted, 
but it's not really the counsel of God. And so I'll stop with the preaching. I don't want anybody to accuse me of meddling with them. The eighth key is the word of God. He promises that he himself will teach you as you read your word, his word. I'm not saying we don't need Bible teachers and preachers. We do. They're a gift that God gives us to really understand the fullness, the nuances of the word of God. But in Luke chapter 24, it has the account of the two disciples walking the road to Emmaus. And the, they know the tomb is empty now. It's just been a short while since Jesus was crucified. The tomb is empty, but nobody really knows. The disciples don't really know what's going on. Where is Jesus? What's happening? But as these two disciples are walking to the road to Emmaus, they're talking about everything, the crucifixion, the empty tomb, and all of a sudden Jesus joins them on the road. But it's an interesting account, and it has a lot of meaning that we don't have time for, but they don't recognize this Jesus. And he says, what are you talking about? They begin to talk about everything that's occurred the last few days. And it says in verse 24, uh, chapter 24, verse 27, Jesus said, it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Jesus said, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And one of the things I want to encourage you, we're going to talk about in a few moments, is when we read the word of God, not just to take in information, but to spend time with God, the Holy Spirit will give you insights, particularly areas applying to your life that he wants to speak into. One of the, uh, a great theologian, songwriter, hymnist, and poet of the 18th century that came out of Scotland, his name is William Cowper, he had a phrase I love, and he said, God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. And when you spend time with God in his word, God will speak to you. He will give you insights that you really need to hear. The ninth key, and you can get excited. We've only got two more after this. <laughs> the ninth key is when we really adhere to the word of God and know the uh, ways of God, it establishes healthy speech. And you think, well, why is that important? It's important because, as Proverbs 18.21 says, death and life are found in the power of the tongue. For example, Paul said in Philippians, do all things without grumbling. All of you know somebody, it could be in a, a work group you're involved with, could be, heaven forbid, but your home group, if you go to a home group or in your extended family, somebody who's always grumbling and always complaining. You can be having a great day, but just being around that minute in person for five minutes, you feel like you're a little bit lower than the gutter. But just the opposite is true when there's someone who is optimistic, especially filled with the Spirit, speaking praise, giving thanks, and excited about what's going on. It changes the atmosphere. Our words have life. We could speak volumes on this we don't have time for. But when it comes to the Word of God, we need to find times and places where you can read God's Word out loud. Like for me, you know, like uh, I love my family, but there's times, especially early in the morning when I'm spending time alone with God, I'll go out in the front porch by myself or the back porch, and I'll read out loud some of my favorite psalms. For me, particularly Psalm 136, Psalm 145, or some of the things of the Gospels. I'll read it out loud because it releases life. It brings a blessing to my house, my household, my family, the day and whatnot. But it's interesting a quote I want to read to you that I pulled off of a website called Science Daily. It, uh, they did a, a study about the best ways to really memorize things, and the study tested four methods of learning, of learning written information, including reading, reading silently, hearing someone else read, listening to a recording of oneself reading, and reading aloud in real time. The results from the test with 95 participants showed that reading out loud to yourself is the best way of retaining information. That there's something about Genesis chapter 1 when we see the earth was formless and void and God spoke light and life and order, fruitfulness came forth. We're creating his image. And I don't want to carry this to extreme that if you say the moon is made of blue, green cheese, it can be made of green cheese. 
But when we speak out words of blessings to ourselves, our family, our situation, even if you're by yourself, it releases life. And when you speak out words, it helps what you're trying to remember get really seated in the brain cells. We don't have time to develop that, but just take it from me. If you don't believe me, just it's true. <laughs> Verse 14, in the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. The word of God reveals what our true wealth is in life. Verses 13 through 16 read, Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain of her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Nothing people desire in this world, wealth, fame, glory, prestige, honor, Nothing compares to really knowing the wisdom of God, the word of God. Long life is in her hand, and in her left hand are riches. Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, But godliness with contentment is great gain. How many countless stories have you read, testimonies, of pop stars, young athletes, movie stars, tech wizards, who all of a sudden at a young age have millions, if not billions of dollars, everything they could want, think they could want, this world tells them they can need, but there's never any contentment. Contentment with godliness is great gain. You don't need a million dollars in the bank. You don't have to be striving to do everything you can to make money or honor prestige to really experience the goodness of God in life. And the word of God leads us into that. And then finally, verses 15 and 16, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. This delight means to be engaged with, to adapt yourself to. And this final key I want to talk about, the word of God, the ways of God, when we uh, walk in them, it brings satisfaction to our souls. Reading God's word is not simply memorizing truth. It is spending time with Jesus, the truth himself. So how do we read the Bible? Although it's not in the overheads, I want to suggest to you that, first of all, read it regularly. I'm not talking about get religious and, you know, if you know, things come up and you miss your morning or afternoon or night devotions, it's the end of the world, God starts loving you. No, he calls us to relationship, not religion. We understand that. But his word is life. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word. And it's life that you take in. It brings transformation that's going to last for eternity, which is much more important than the food we're actually eating. Secondly, read the Bible prayerfully. When you spend time in the word, go before God, first of all, and say, God, speak to me. Lead me and guide me. Speak into what you want to speak in my life. When I, when I do that, I say, Lord, would you lead me and guide me? I also say, would you comfort me in your Father's heart? Would you convict me about errors I need to change? And so we're cognizant of the fact that we're spending time with God. But secondly, read the Word of God meditatively. The word meditation, to a lot of people's minds, has been hijacked by Eastern religions, Hinduism, and in those religions, uh, meditation means to completely empty yourself, to zone out, and the problem with that, the reality of it is you open yourself up to spirit guides, i.e. demons, all sorts of things. The Bible, and especially in the Old Testament, Hebrew speaks quite a bit about meditation. But meditation, biblically speaking, means to focus on God, to speak his word, to read his word, even sing his word. In Psalm 119, verse 148, the psalmist said, my eyes are awake before the watches of the night, that I may meditate on your promises. The Hebrew word for meditate is sayah, and it literally means to speak, to sing, and to commune. Now, I understand a lot of places where you may end up reading your Bible, you can't speak out loud. And again, I'm not saying get religious about it, but find those times where you can be by yourself, especially portions of scriptures, the Psalms, and when there's blessings, of, you know, like the apostolic blessings, Read those out loud. It brings life to you. And uh, read the Word of God slowly. I don't mean like 
you have said. <laughs> but take your time with it. It's not just a textbook that we're trying to memorize in truth, but we're spending time with the truth himself. Spend time with it. And it's not always a matter of the quantity of how much scripture you read, but it's the quality of the time you have. Let me close with this, with what Jesus said, these words of his. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And whenever you read about a rock in the Bible, primarily it's symbolic about Jesus, who he himself is the rock of our salvation. And he continued, the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not heed them would be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that, storm, that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. We all experience storms of life. We experience storms of adversity, storms of relationship challenges, storms of financial challenges, storms of health issues, uh, seasons where you just feel like maybe you're fighting for your sanity. There could be challenges of temptations. But we overcome these by two ways, by heeding God's word, growing in it, and leaning in to his Holy Spirit. And it's interesting when people say, well, you know, we're just under grace. But God's definition of grace is his word in your life and his spirit in your life that give you the power and the ability to be an overcomer. Amen. Are you alive? Amen. Seven times Jesus spoke to the churches in Revelation, and he said, those who overcome were called to win a few battles. And it's not just the battle without, it's the battle within, with all the temptation and everything else.